Hey everybody, it's Alexander Dahl with Manifest Brutality, returning for 2021. Uh, so I'm in the process of getting all of my uh, Wave 3 interviews scheduled, um, but I do have one uh, remaining from Wave 2 that I've been waiting to put out because the uh, person requested that I wait until um, a publishing date for his album, which happens to be uh, tomorrow, uh, January 21st. So we're going to go ahead and uh, do that interview today. And then um, I'll have more coming up shortly. I've started booking already for this weekend into next week. And I'll probably shoot for about 15 interviews in total for Wave 3. And then uh, we'll see where we go from there. Um, other than that, I've been... Um, deep in my quarantine hole, um, avoiding going outside and, um, working on music and doing other things and general, general laziness and whatnot. But here we go. We'll get into it and we'll get this ball rolling again. All right. Bye. All right. I'm on the phone with, uh, Joe. He's one of the people that reached out to me about the current interview series. Uh, and I'm going to give Joe the chance to go ahead and introduce himself. Hi, everybody. This is Joe. Uh, for those of you who are German, my name is Joachim Becker. Actually, my family's from Germany, but uh, I go by Joe, Joe Becker, and uh, been playing drums for quite a while. Uh, but let's get to the interview, and I'll be happy to uh, get into some more details, so take it away. Excellent. So, Joe, go ahead and uh, share with me some information about how you first kind of identified with music and kind of what made you realize that's what you wanted to do with your life. Well, the I was always tapping on things. I was, I was hitting pots and pans and I was banging on, on wood stuff. And, uh, I ended up joining the, the band in fourth grade and I wanted to play drums, of course, but they, they didn't have, uh, they had that covered already. So I, I ended up having to play trombone. So I played trombone for about six years. Mm -hmm. And, and then in the meantime, uh, when it came to around 10th grade, uh, my grandmother, who was in town from Germany, uh, ended up helping me buy a drum set. So it took a little while, uh, but I ended up having to play trom trombone for about five years. <laughs> nice. So, uh, uh, but I, I was I was pounding on everything incessantly, and and mom said, "Oh, for God's sakes, get him a drum set." <laughs> so. Okay, so you kind of started in concert band when you were a pretty young age and kind of uh, worked with it how you could, right? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So once you kind of established the fact that uh, music was going to stay with you or you're going to continue to do that, how did that progress like once you got out of high school and then like, through the college years? How did you continue to develop uh, your instrumentation and, and playing? Well, that's where it gets interesting because I think a lot of people, especially who take up a, a rock band instrument, uh, you have these visions of grandeur. You really think you're going to be you know, rock and roll stars. That's what that's what kind of motivates a lot of people. Uh, it, but of course, that was like a pipe dream for me. Uh, it's, it's just not going to happen. I ended up going to college. Uh, to make a long story short, after about a year and a half, it was very clear that uh, I was college was just not for me at that point. Okay. Um, I was seriously, I was seriously at a point where. Uh, I was about to take my own life, believe it or not. Oh, no. And, yeah, my mother caught wind of that, as, as moms do. They snoop through your stuff. Mm -hmm. And she she said, you know, what are we wasting time in college for uh, if, if you're in this kind of a bad mood? Now, I was kicked out for bad grades, so nothing was working. Okay. And so she said, well, wh what do you want to do with your life? And I said, you know, this was a shot in the dark, but I said, you know, mom, I want to be a rock star. <laughs> sure. And so she said, well, what are you doing here? Get in a band. Mm -hmm. And, and then she said, uh, you know, if you're not in a working band working every night within the next week, I'm kicking you out of the house, which <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> not a lot of mothers will say that, Yeah, that could, but it was a... true. It was that's a bit reverse than how that usually goes. It was uh, it was about literally it was six days later. I auditioned for a 
traveling band and I got the gig nice. and I ended up traveling the Midwest six nights a week, uh, 50 weeks a year, uh, you know, around the Midwest, about 12 different States playing every night for three and a half hours, uh, for the next two years. So that, that is, you know, if you want to call that being a professional musician, that is how I got into that. That's awesome. So, what was that first band that you toured around with? This was a <laughs> this was a band, a, a GMA band. For those of you in the Twin Cities, you may recognize that agency. Mm. Uh, they they had a lot of bands, and, and the particular band I was with was Sammy's Fortune, which was uh, Sammy used to be a wide receiver for the Dallas Cowboys at the time. Now we're talking early '80s. Sure. And he got cut, I think, after a season or two seasons. But in that time, he had made a substantial amount of money, and but he always wanted to be a singer. So with that money, with Sammy's fortune, he uh, ended up buying band gear, a truck, went on the road, hired a bunch of musicians, and he lived out his dream, which he is, by the way, still doing cool. uh, to this day. Uh, but that's that's how the band started. So it was it was just a traveling cover band. We covered a lot of ground, just like a lot of the other bands did. We ended up like I said, six nights a week, traveling all over the Midwest. But um, that was really a, a that was really a great experience because you figured out what you needed to do to live that lifestyle. We were we were on the surface wagon, uh, making it happen. So, so, how many people get to that spot? So, what happened when you decided that that was no longer a fit for you? Well, there was a, I ended up getting into another band. And we started playing, you know, really the same songs. We started playing the same clubs. Uh, and after a while, it's it's kind of like uh, Groundhog Day, the movie. And it's just, sure. okay, I, I've been through this. This is enough. Uh, I'm at this level, and I've plateaued, and I've, I've got to move on. I've, I've got to get, uh, I've got to boost myself higher. Uh, so I just, I made a break. I said, that's it. I'm, I'm off. I'm I'm not I'm going to quit. I'm going to work regular job until I find an opportunity that lets me go a step up. Sure. So what was that next opportunity that landed for you? Yeah, and and there's a whole long story in that which I can't go into, but Okay. <laughs> uh, but but friends of mine, high school uh my high school buddy uh two of them were the original members of the metal band Obsession. And oh, again, nice. people that were on the, you know, going to the club scene in the 80s, early 80s, Obsession was the shit here in town. Yeah, for sure. And I, so, I remember hearing about them. Yeah, so so here's a band that was, you know, in the big hair metal and which was really not my thing at all, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, but I knew that I knew a couple of the guys and they were, you know, doing their own material. They were putting on this over the top show, they had all these crowds. They had chicks. My goodness, they <laughs> you know everything that a rock and roll guy aspires to. Right, and, right. And I said, and I said, wow, I would, you know, I would do almost anything. Uh, and you know, and, and I knew the drummer Todd. I knew him very well. Mm -hmm. uh, I said I would love it if Todd quits and they give me the job. Now this was a <laughs> yeah. This is a, I'm smoking something at this point. This is a pipe dream. Mm -hmm. uh, but then fast forward a couple, I don't know, a year later, and I got a, uh, I had put my name out in, into Musicians Referral Service. Okay. At that time, you had to pay $100 to be listed. Uh, so that was big money for somebody who wanted to, to connect with other musicians. Right. And this wasn't, this wasn't doing anything for me. I got an accordion player that called me, and that didn't work out. Uh, but I got a call from the singer of Obsession, who I didn't really know. Sure. And and he said, well, you know, I got your name from the list, and uh, we're auditioning drummers. And, of course, I, I couldn't believe it. I could not believe that what I had dreamt of was actually, it happened. Yeah, that's a pretty so, serendipitous turnabout. So I ended up... Uh, what it turned out was they were uh, uh, changing musical genres and they were going more into a, a, a kind of a Rolling Stones, uh, Tom Petty, kind of a blues, bluesier 
uh, and doing just original. Okay. And yeah. I, I had no idea they were doing this. And I think that Todd, the other drummer, didn't want to go down that path. Sure. And I came in having had a lot of experience playing a lot of different music over the two years. Uh, and also having done weddings and having gone into, I was in a blues band and I was in a, uh, I was subbing for a country band. And so I had this, this material I had to learn for blues and country, neither of which I really liked that much at the time. So I walk in and they ask me just to play what is appropriate for this song that we're writing. And, uh, so I just pulled out all my, you know, my crayon that I had in my box. Sure. And I said, what's going to work best for this song? And so I, you know, they did, did like a country shuffle beat. And I said to myself, well, this doesn't sound like a metal song. Mm -hmm. This sounds like a country shuffle. So I'm going to play a country shuffle, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, and Bryn, you know, kind of the, the, the lead guitar player and the kind of, you know, head guy in the whole operation, he just, he just jumped and he, he looked at me, he goes, that's it. That's <laughs> it. He nailed it. Nice. Because they were looking, they were looking for somebody to play that stuff. While all the, uh, there were like 20 other auditioning drummers who came in playing big hair metal. Okay. And that's not what they wanted. So in a kind of a, a almost accidentally, I got this gig. Well, and that's, and that's, that's cool. at that time obsession. Then we changed our name to Funhouse, so mm. that's how that transition happened. Okay, so how long were you with Funhouse then? Well, that was uh, I was with Funhouse for about five years. Okay, and, and you guys toured all over, also I assume. We well, we went. Uh, we did a lot of shows, uh, you know, around the state. We we did some opening acts. I think we opened up for. Uh, Starship, and we opened up for uh, REO Speedwagon, and we mm -hmm. uh, so we did some some gigs here, and then of course we we were all original already. We were completely original, sure. And so we would travel to the coast a couple times a year. So we were in L.A. twice a year, and New York twice a year. And after five years, uh, it was really disheartening to show up at a showcase gig. Uh, all set up, ready to go, and A and R guy, who was supposed to be down there, he would call our manager up and say, uh, "Hey, look, I got a sick kid. I can't be there tonight." Oh no! So we spent all this energy, and it didn't work out. So the band said, "Look, we we have got to camp ourselves out here, either in L.A. or in New York, and we've we've got to just be here where where we can make it happen." So we, we picked New York, and mm -hmm. we ended up moving to New York. Awesome. And so how long were you guys based out of New York then? Well, we were in New York for about two and a half years. Okay. And at that point, at that point, we also made a decision we didn't want to, uh, uh, because we had traveled to New York three or four times prior as Funhouse, and we didn't want to give the impression that, while well, we're coming back again, and, and the A and I, our guys saying, "Yeah, we've seen these guys already." So right. we uh, we changed our name. We changed it to Rattling Bones, mm -hmm. and and I don't know if it was intentional, but just being in town, living in Manhattan on the Lower East Side, we got exposed, you know, to the neighborhood and, and to a whole different life. And the music really did change. It got grittier and it got real. Sure. We didn't have as much of the shtick that we did with Funhouse. We were much more, uh, I would say, maybe Black Crows, you know, or Deep Purpley. Okay. And and so we got some some pretty good traction. Uh, again, we don't have time to go through it, but we we worked with some huge name producers, huge uh, talent out there, and it was it was really something heady. To, to, to be able to, to, you know, be in the industry with all of this stuff going on. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, that's great. Doing some tour dates with Ace Freely, and then we, you know, we travel up to Canada, and we, anyway, there's, and then when you think about 
you know, I don't know, 12 years prior to that, I was sitting in my room thinking, huh, I want to be a rock star. Right. And here is about as close as you can get to it in New York, working with some of the biggest names in the world of music. And it's, it is Wow. I mean, your head about explodes when you're in that spot. Yeah, that's that's an amazing you know? turnaround. So w- yeah. after your experiences in New York and working like with some of the uh, big people in the industry, uh, what uh, brought you back to the Midwest? Uh, a car. No. <laughs> uh, the, indeed. indeed. You know, it, it, it took a little too long. Uh, there's just a combination of a lot of different things. Management that we had management change, and it, and it uh, that, again, that's a whole, whole another story in there. Uh, mm-hmm. per, personal uh, life challenges and things going on, and, sure. and so uh, other musicians had networked and found um, some other musical uh, project that they mm. got immersed in, and sure, sure. And at, at at that time, my sister was going through a divorce. And my father's company wanted me back. Uh, being broke out there, it was pretty easy to say, hey, you know, I'm making pretty good money uh, if I come back. So uh, I decided to come back to the Twin Cities. And, sure. Uh, kind of ended, ended on a whimper, but, well, you know, we did it. Yeah, it definitely sounds like you, you know, you made a good stretch and you were in the industry. You know, not, not everybody's in it forever, except for, you know, a oh. couple people. But... For the most part, it sounds like you had a really good uh, run with it. And so from where you are now, uh, what what sort of musical projects are you working on today? Well, you know, about a year and a half ago, the same guitar player, Bryn, who was the headmaster of, you know, Obsession, mm-hmm. uh, he's working with a lot of artists, a big name artist. He's, he's still in the business 110%. Mm-hmm. And it was his intention to showcase Minnesota music. And he asked me if I wanted to drum for the uh, Minnesota music machine, which is really a tribute band to all, you know, Minnesota music. Sure. From Dylan to Prince to uh, Husker Du to uh, Curtis A, all the people that really put Minnesota on the map. Mm-hmm. And that was going great. We had, we had, uh, we're, in fact, we're still, you know, we're still a, a project, but, we were doing gigs and having a great time until uh, COVID hit right. in February. So that, I mean, we had gigs on the calendar and boom, they're gone. But, um, you know, in the meantime, uh, one, well, one of the bands that we cover as part of the Minnesota Musicians was Dare Force. And oh, nice. again, for those of you, Dare Force is a big name. They were a big band around. Mm-hmm. Uh and I go back with Brian Bart because we did a lot of recording over at Brian Bart's studio. He was the guitar player for Dare Force. And the other co-founder ended up, uh, 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 John O'Neill, he ended up coming out to our gigs, and he would sit in on the Dare Force song that we covered and during our Minnesota Music Machine show. And awesome. we got to talk, and we're, we're very similar in a lot of ways. And... Um, it was about a month ago, uh, probably two months ago, that uh, he asked me to uh, record some drums for his upcoming uh, solo CD. So, kind of to fast forward, those tracks are now in the can and they're being mixed. And uh, and he was so happy with the results and, and our camaraderie that we're now putting a uh, like a live band together to go out and do this material. Mm-hmm. Once the clubs are open again, awesome. That's very cool. So that's kind of an interesting uh, uh, new project, yeah. and we're we're going to be doing some. We're going to try our hand at writing some additional material together. And uh, one of the guys, you know, in in that process, uh, one of the people I met in New York City happens to be the uh, old keyboard player for UFO, okay. and so we needed some keyboard on there. So we got him involved and. So there's there's going to be a collaboration, you know, from this side of the ocean, and also uh, for, with keyboards coming over from uh, from Europe, awesome. where he lives. Very so, cool. Just kind of an interesting interesting time here. Yeah, definitely. the The virus has made quite an impact. 
pretty much everybody that I interview always talks about how the virus hit and just their entire like expression has been shut down. So, yep. um, what do you want to share like a couple of the most prominent stories that kind of stand out to you throughout like your time with music? You already kind of went through some of them. So if it's too off the cuff, I kind of understand. <laughs> well, th- you know, the biggest one that I, I think is important to share, especially for maybe newbies, I grew up as a kid and as a teenager, I grew up listening to Rush. I was listening to the yeah, the Janice, mm-hmm. Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. I was into the uh, the prog rock, you know, because the drummer's going a mile a minute and, and it's technical and it's, ooh, look at all these notes they're playing, you know, mm-hmm. stuff. But... I wanted to play so bad, and one of the first bands I saw listed on paper was, uh, I called them up, and they said, well, we're a blues band. And I said, oh, I don't I don't want to play blues. <laughs> That's so simple. Right. But they were the only thing in town. And so I said, I just, I'll try it. And I got the gig, and we were playing for you know a couple of years, and I got to learn all the blues standards. Uh you know, going way back, Robert Johnson, all this stuff that really, for me, I was embarrassed. I never knew about this stuff. And uh, we 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 were uh, doing some front gigs. We fronted uh, Sugar Blue and Buddy Guy. And so I got to meet these, you know, these big blues legends. Well, it turns out we, uh, we were fronting Willie Dixon. Uh, and again, Willie Dixon, if you're a Led Zeppelin fan, you're a Willie Dixon fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were fronting Willie Dixon the night after Muddy Waters died, oh. who is kind of the, I don't know, the godfather of blues. Right. And it, so we finished our set, and then we, we, I went into the crowd, and this place was packed. It was packed. It was just incredible. And I watched Willie Dixon play, and he was actually in, he was in pain. He was in so much physical pain. And, he was he was playing his guitar, and I will never ever forget him playing that guitar. Absolutely, just it was just the pain coming out. I had never witnessed that before, mm. and something inside me just clicked. Just it just clicked right there. I get goosebumps every time I tell that story. Yeah, and that's... so you fast forward. I think. Even to that audition, when I auditioned for Funhouse, when, you know, most people would have said, okay, well, I'm just going to play as fast as I can, as hair metal as I can. Mm -hmm. I went back to the lesson I was taught uh, just to just nail it. And that's what I pulled on. That's the, that's where I went into that bag of tricks or whatever. That's what I used. And that is an Every band I've ever been in, that moment, that learning the fundamentals and having been exposed to the building blocks, bam, I will tell you that did more for me than anything else. I I would definitely agree. there's uh, There's a very big difference between somebody that's playing to fit the song and can can emote to that versus somebody that is just going the mile a minute and playing what, you know, and filling every beat with as much as they think they can. Right. There, there are times when it's appropriate and it works. Right. But if it's not, it's not. Well, so, um, you, so you mentioned uh, some projects that you have going. Do you have any, uh, like, links on Facebook or anything where people can kind of take a listen to what you're working on? Uh, you'd have to look up John O'Neill. Uh, John's really in charge of that project. Okay. Um, and he's, post- he's posting from time to time, I think, He's got a real small clip of me in the studio uh, right now, but he may put up a, a snippet of of a mix. And it's it's John. Uh, and it's one. It's O'Neill. Uh, o apostrophe N E I L one L. Okay, um, I'll I'll look him up uh, when I post this, so I can make sure that that gets linked. Uh, yeah, along yeah, yeah. With the video, and he'll he'll be posting more. Like he's putting out a CD. Mm-hmm. At some point, like I said, we want to get out live and, and promote that. So sure. uh, that's coming up. And if there's new material, great. You know, we'll, we'll add that to it. Awesome. 
Well, so what I like to do for the people that I interview is give them the opportunity to have the last word. Uh, so basically just the message that you kind of feel just resonates like from your experiences. So uh, what would be your last word? My last word to aspiring musicians, there's only two things. One of them is network. Network with people. Uh, treat them professionally because they will come back. They will come back, and you will have an opportunity to leverage that. So be professional, um, and when you're listening uh, or when you're playing in the group, let's say, uh, or even when you're you know, in a conversation with these people, this goes for any industry, listen, 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 and contribute to that. Uh, you know, if, uh, if, you, if you've got a great band and the guitar player is doing a solo and you're the drummer, Back off. That's that person's moment to shine. If you let the rest of the musicians shine, you end up sounding so much better. And I, I can't tell you how many times I, I, I don't have the chops. I, I really don't. I'm not a technically proficient drummer. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times people would come up to me after a gig and go, wow, that was so great working with you. Fantastic. That's how I would get callbacks is because I let the other musicians shine. It will never let you down, uh, and you don't. And you do the music proud by, by the music comes first, not your single singular parts. 